etc. Welcome everyone to another special edition of the Geek of All Trades podcast, our first ever live broadcast. Today I have with me Jimmy McMichael without the extra S, Don Hello. Early, oh, Don Early, who are both from Dead Gentleman Productions, and I love your tag there, Benjamin, on the bottom there. You're uh, the draw man for Dead That's Gentleman me. Productions. Uh, Dracarium, is, <laughs> Dracarium is very familiar with Ben. He guests on quite a few of our podcasts. Gentlemen, Mr. Early, Mr. McMichael, it is a pleasure to have you here today. Hey, thanks for having us. Thanks a lot. It's wonderful, wonderful. I just like I feel like this is my second uh, episode of Delusions of Grandeur. I'm with people who are quite famous. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, okay, <laughs> we, we we appreciate uh, being apparently Your famous. Delusion. <laughs> <laughs> All right, gentlemen. So, uh, can you explain to us for uh, the listeners on Dracarium who might not be familiar with you, what is Dead Gentleman Productions? Uh, we are a media entertainment group um, that have been making movies and web series since uh, well, 1999, really is when we got started uh, with Demon Hunters and then uh, Demon Hunters Dead Camper Lake. Uh, what we are most notably probably famous for is our uh, short film The Gamers, uh, which came out in uh, 2002, and that's actually when we decided to form the company, Dead Gentleman Productions, LLC. Uh, and then, of course, we've gone on to make uh, The Gamers Darkness Rising, um, the Gamers' Hands of Fate, most recently The Gamers' Humans and Households, which was a co-production with um, Zoe and um, I'm blanking on the Canadian company right now, but um, uh, we had a shared Kickstarter on that one, and that was a really fun sort of collaboration project we did. So, um, But we've done, uh, we're, this year we've kind of branched out, uh, we've done a few new things, and um, Jimmy, you, I'll turn it over to you. you we, we branched out into into a webcomic. Jimmy, are you there? Sorry, I missed my uh, transition there. What, what are we talking about? <laughs> <laughs> like Bill O'Reilly, we're doing it live. Wow. <laughs> I'm talking about your, uh, your minus am, five charisma. I am that boring. <laughs> <laughs> So, so I I was saying that uh, we we're not just uh, video and, and film production and you know we do uh, we do web comic. Ah yes. And there I was going to transition to you to talk more about that. <laughs> so yeah, uh, demon hunterscom is our uh, web comic. We've taken the original Demon Hunters movies that brought us together as a group, and we're um, Re rebooting it. Uh, we've gone back to before the beginning of the movies and uh, tr kind of uh, redesigned the world, incorporating all of the uh, stuff we've uh, changed and things we've learned about how to actually tell a story over the past 15 years. <laughs> and uh, so, yeah, uh, it's a great time to jump on board. <laughs> it's it's always a great time. At the beginning. It it is a it's a damn good webcomic too, and I'm not just saying that because my friend writes for it <laughs> or draws yeah. for it. Right now, sorry. <laughs> so, uh, uh, Don, you mentioned Zoe. That's uh, short for Zombie Orpheus Entertainment, correct? How, correct. Uh, what is the partnership between Dead Gentleman and uh, Zombie Orpheus Entertainment, <laughs> and how did that really come about? <laughs> That's a great question. We've been getting that one a lot. Uh, well, for obvious reasons, uh, there's clearly a lot of overlap. Um, what happened was uh, Ben Dobbins uh, joined forces with a few other folks to create Zombie Orpheus Entertainment, and uh, he had some specific uh, business plans, and good God, Jimmy. Right? Hashtag professionalism. I love it. <laughs> Much like my Dixie Cup here. Because <laughs> yeah. I'm all about the party. We all know about professionalism, don't we? Yeah, yeah. And, and sponsorships. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you were going to go with the ice cream bar there, Benjamin. Were you eating the fudgy pudgy? I don't have any fudgy pudgies. You are a fudgy pudgy. <laughs> no. 
Look, I've never heard that one a hundred times. I know, right? <laughs> yeah, so uh, Zombie Orpheus Entertainment uh, was really born out of Ben's desire to um, have this sort of fan-supported network um, and go out and, and really kind of uh, flesh that out. And just because of the nature of how Dead Gentleman Productions LLC is set up uh, structurally and whatnot, um, it just made a lot more sense and it was a lot easier and cleaner for him to create a new company to do that. Um, DG at the time uh, was also kind of in a, I would say, stasis mode. We were pretty tired and burnt out from making Darkness Rising um, and getting burned horribly on distribution uh, on that, uh, our original deal. So, uh, so we kind of went in to coastal maintain mode and uh, Zombie Orpheus ended up um, uh, doing the productions that we might have done otherwise uh, just because we just didn't have the energy or the ability to do those. So um, we're back, and Zoe's carried the torch and created their own um, uh, network and business plan, and we're extremely uh, complementary in partnership in with what they're doing. Um, so yeah, it's really really cool. We uh, Zoe uh, Zombie Orpheus has the ability to engage in a lot of different kinds of properties and and projects, uh, whereas DG, our, you know, Dead Gentlemen, we're, we're branding is a bit specific, and we, um, we're we pretty much going to be catering to our, our geek gamer uh, audience, uh, as well as little experimental fun projects, like maybe more sketch comedy or that kind of thing. Okay, gotcha. Hey, it looks like we, uh, might, we may have lost Jimmy for a few minutes, so we're just going to yeah. kind of push forward here for a minute. I'll ask you personally this one. Uh, is Dead Gentleman Productions a full-time project that pays your guys' bills, or is it just kind of a hobby that you make a little side cash with? Yeah, that would be a hobby. <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, it's, um, it's something that I feel very strongly that when you're doing art, um, in particular the, what we're doing is, is a film production and, and media production, um, you can imagine that it takes a lot of people to do what we do um, and to pay everyone uh, a salary that pays the bills, that would that would cause for a lot of money uh, annually and we don't currently have that. So, so it's a yeah. hard is it something that you would hope to get, uh, that you would hope would get big enough to where you could do Dead Gentleman full time? Maybe. I'm not really concerned about it. Uh, I think that there's part of the the draw of doing Dead Gentlemen the way we're doing it is that it still is fun and it is still uh, a labor of love. And, and so if you make it your job, then that can kind of sour that sometimes. I've had experience with that um, where you make your your passion, your work, um, and I don't want to lose that. Uh, so, however, uh, don't get me wrong, I'm definitely going down the path of a uh, uh, business plan that makes us know, and um, if we get big enough and we just happen to have to quit our job. So that We're not we can, averse to making all of our money off of this. <laughs> yeah, that would be amazing and awesome, and I bet we could so figure that out. Help us do that. Yeah. yeah uh, Patreon links below. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I, right. does that answer your question? Yes, it most it certainly does. Okay, so uh, it looks like we got Jimmy back. Also, we'll get uh, yeah, we'll aim that. this question at both of you. Have your views or on gaming or gamer culture changed since you're now so ingrained in it, making all the films that you've made? Since you brought and shared this joy, like your love of geekdom, and then obviously your love of filmmaking. Have, have your views on gamer culture or gaming in itself changed since you guys have started doing Dead Gentlemen? Um, I would say yes, but it's not because we were introduced, as maybe your question might um, uh, imply. 
a lot of us, not Jimmy, um, a lot of us were gamers to begin with. And so, um, so yeah, the gaming culture, I would say, over the past 10 to 15 years has definitely changed. Um, and I think that, you know, maybe, maybe that since we've gotten to know some of the higher-ups in various gaming companies, um, that's been rad as hell. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so we get a, a little bit more of a perspective on, on that way and um, kind of try, you, know, you get kind of a sneak peek on how the culture is, is evolving and, and that sort of thing. So I guess we get a little bit of a sneak peek in that, but I don't know that doing the movies changed us. Um, other than I would say that, again, the gamers and the gamers' darkness rising, we were really all about taking that subculture that was um, sort of looked as uh, derisive or, or uh, not, not fully human or, you know, whatever it is, weird and geeks and, and whatnot. Like, like outcasts, kind of, yeah. like an outcast culture. Yeah, and so our movies uh, dealt with that, and I felt like we... Um, we did our part in trying to normalize that and say, hey, you know, we're people too and we have a lot of fun. And it is interesting that this very sort of antisocial subculture joins together and does an incredibly social activity, you know. Um, and other people might want to learn from that. And so I think we, with our movies, we kind of tackled that a little bit. Um, but today, uh, not to say that, oh, them whippersnappers, but, you know, uh, today D&D &D and geek culture, is, it's kind of in, and it's the thing, and it's like... We won. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, is, it is very chic these days, it seems, and a lot of people seem to be wanting to defend that culture, like, like kind of like... Um, they, they they feel like people are intruding on something that was uniquely theirs. Like they look, it's almost like they view inclusion like it's a bad thing. Sort of, uh, um, what's the word I want to say? Um, I don't know. <laughs> I've forgotten. I've forgotten my words. I think if these jocks want to play D and D with us, they're going to need to suffer some swirlies like we did. <laughs> I mean, I didn't. <laughs> I never got swirly. Look yeah. at my hair. I never got swirly. So you, uh, I to come back. You're kind of thinking about entitlement. That's the word I was looking for. Is that kind of where you're coming from? Well, it, I just I don't know about entitlement. It just I I in many geeks that I've spoken to before, there's a one guy in particular that I work with that kind of looks at it like his it's his hill to die on, mm. and then the more people that it's like almost like they're perverting the hobby. I mean, it's the same, I would say it's kind of the same way like cell phone games. Like a lot of people look at, say, stuff like Candy Crush, like, that's not a real video game. Well, the real video game or not, it rakes in a million bucks a day. Yeah, I mean, you can't ignore that. And, and it's games exactly like that, that um, women are in the majority of players of those kinds of games. Um and that is a whole new demographic of what is considered now gaming. And thank you, Facebook, I guess. I guess. <laughs> you know, actually, uh, part of that entitlement issue uh, kind of reminds me of the plot of the movie Zero Charisma, where uh, right. it, was like, it was like gamer versus his hipsters. Yeah. And, uh, just the idea of, you know, are you doing it because it's cool or are you doing it because you've loved it all this time? and. You know, like just the, the walls that were kind of put up in people's expectations, and I love the movie and recommend it. <laughs> Fair enough. Jimmy, what are your thoughts? I really all, to me, it's just kind of all feels like hipsters. Like, I was into this before it was cool, whether it's gaming or superheroes or whatever. It's like, <laughs> peak culture has taken over the planet, so, uh, yeah. I don't care if you were into Batman before it was cool. Batman's awesome. Everyone should enjoy him. <laughs> <laughs> right. Spider-Man would totally kick Batman's oh, ass. Benjamin man, mentioned... Just connect. We're done. 
<laughs> uh, full disclosure: I'm actually really not that into comic books. I just throw I just throw that jab in there every time to Batman fans because, like, I think really, I like I know the big ones: Superman, Wonder Woman, so on and so forth. But the ones that I've even come close to caring about are only Spider Man and Deadpool. Thank you, Benjamin. <laughs> So uh, we did a Geek of All Trades podcast with Benjamin a while back, and he mentioned in our interview that uh, you guys ran into problems that uh, when you guys were shooting the Demon Hunters movies originally on the campus that you cu were currently attending. Uh, what problems were you experiencing while you were shooting the film? Um... On campus, I don't think we really had problems. It was when we left the campus, uh, sp specifically for Dead Camper Lake. Uh, we shot that on site at a uh, retreat up in the it was a former coal mining town that was turned into like a, a Lutheran retreat and we're specifically not saying the name of it because they want nothing to do with us. <laughs> yeah, apparently that isn't true anymore. Uh, uh, they uh, All the people who were involved at, at the time are gone ah. and it's actually required viewing for uh, some of the younger <laughs> crowd now. Uh, that's nice. over there. They have a a copy of the movie up there. No, um, we yeah, did perform we, a human sacrifice on their altar in their chapel. So, <laughs> yeah, I mean, what do you do? Um, no, and I mean, it, they're they're very much of a, a sort of community um, pacifist. They're uh, Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And we show up with our truckloads of guns. And right. Yeah. <laughs> so that was kind of a bit of a contention because we're actually like visibly wearing weapons, and um, we definitely had one. I remember one incident where some of the kids who were up as the retreat had gotten into our plastic toy gun uh, stash and were going around and. Uh, Being kids. <laughs> kind of caught hell for that. Um, yeah, but they were, they were doing the kids. Thing of like pointing them at people and stuff like that, or oh, yeah. like playing the cops and robbers type thing. Oh yeah, it, doing normal kid stuff. Um, but you know, it was again a non-violent, non-violence promoting community, and we were there on special circumstance, and yeah, it was weird. Anyway, but <laughs> we got over it, and you know, I I continue to say it's better to um, say you're sorry than ask permission. <laughs> Did you guys run into any other problems filming anything else? Any it, like just with either like say equipment, or do you guys have like any funny stories? It's something that might have gone wrong when you guys were filming. <laughs> oh, Dorkness Rising is <laughs> full of those things. My God, it's had a graveyard on fire. Kinda. <laughs> uh, I borrowed my boss's generator at the time, um, and. Uh, our grips uh, d decided to try and sound deaden it by um, nailing uh, plywood together and then putting insulation, like fiberglass insulation, tacked to it. And then they set this over the generator and wondered why it caught on fire. <laughs> <laughs> um and well, it stopped working, and it certainly uh, shut up. Uh, but yeah, I think the um, I think the flames were probably 15, 20 feet high. Wow. Yeah, it was pretty serious. I was going nuts, <laughs> <laughs> and I got to find out how how good our production insurance was. Turns out pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> At least that story had a happy ending. Yeah, yeah. But, I mean, that's just one thing. Gosh, uh, we were shooting on a Frankenstein camera that was uh, a carryover from, no kidding, Attack of the Clones. Um, this was just as HD was becoming the thing to shoot in, and um, it was this amalgamation of this weird format camera. Um, ended up only three decks in the nation could play the tapes. <laughs> and uh, true story, uh, we spent more on the insurance for the deck than we did on the entire production. Good God. <laughs> 
So, by the way, Dorkness Rising, as popular as it has been, has still made no money. Oh. <laughs> and it was made for about the same price as Journey Quest Season 2. So I'm a little bitter about that. <laughs> hey, Jimmy, do you have any fun stories that you can tell from uh, set mishaps or anything like that? Uh, I don't know. Uh, plenty of people getting junked. Uh, Nathan Rice took a turkey to the crotch during Darkness Rising, I know. <laughs> yep. we, had a, we had a super cut of uh, accidental ball hits uh, at the end of Demon Hunters 2. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, Demon Hunters 2... Uh, Matt Shimkus got near hyperthermia. Oh, um, <laughs> Almost lost some toes. He was out there in four foot deep snow wearing Chuck Taylors. Yeah. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Didn't yeah. find that costume too well. <laughs> See, that's, yeah. one that, that, that's a valuable life lesson there. Chuck Taylors are definitely not winter shoes. No, <laughs> and I think we set Phil Price on fire during the filming of the Gamers. Yep. One of the torches got away from us. That's right. <laughs> Bill Price, I think, slept an entire 20 minutes the uh, the whole week that we uh, shot Dead Camper Lake. <laughs> Poor guy. Then what other kinds of problems in general have you guys run into just being just being independent filmmakers? Uh, well. You know, I would say that a lot of it has to come down to when you're, especially when you're planning a project and um, trying to wrestle scope versus what you can actually do logistically. We, Dead Gentleman has, for a long time, has had this mantra that uh, limitation spawns creativity. And I think that's very true if you're willing to live in that space. Um, if there's a certain standard that you're trying to meet that won't allow that, that can be a huge roadblock. And so that can create some creative tensions, I think. Um, and I think we've definitely experienced some of that. Um, but uh, other, other issues, gosh. Um, I'd say the hardest thing as an independent is obscurity. Uh, yeah. Getting people to find out about us in the first place. We've, uh, ever since the beginning, we've, we've gotten emails from people saying, oh, your, your movie's on this pirate site. Do you want us, what do you want to do about it? Like, let it stay there. The more people who see it, yeah, share it, watch it, everybody. <laughs> they have no problem with that. Let it blow like the wind. <laughs> yeah, we um, actually encourage piracy. Everything we've got out there is uh, Creative Commons, so just take it and share it. And if you like it, Please give us money, but if not, maybe show it to some friends, and maybe they'll like it enough to give us some money. <laughs> That's right. Patreon links below. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, really just getting out there. And we were lucky to start uh, with, almost from the beginning, with uh, the fan base like we did, that niche market of game, gamer culture that has really glommed onto us, and go oh, guys. Yeah. Thank you for that. <laughs> Well, that's one thing that's really changed over the years, too. Um, when we started, this was before YouTube, really. Um, yeah, there was no video hosting online. No. It was anywhere near cost-effective. So we were, we were hawking our gamers VHS tapes uh, out to the conventions, and that was a really brilliant part on Ben's part, I think, Ben Dobbins, uh, who... Um, he just started, instead of really, we, we got the one really good write-up at the Hawaii International Film Festival. I don't know how the hell we got into that. Um, but they loved the gamers. And he just started uh, mailing out screener copies to a bunch of conventions. And we ended up just going to conventions and, and showing the movie, just having a set up at the booth and let people kind of walk by and watch the scene. And um, I can't tell you how many people, sight unseen, just watched a couple of the scenes, laughed hysterically, and said, okay, here's my money, <laughs> um, and, and bought it. That really, 
ramped us up and built our, our audience internationally. Um, I think we really got known. Um, we ran our own store, uh, self-distributed, um, sent it out to um, I sent our movies out to the the gaming distributions like ACD and Alliance, and built those relationships. And then YouTube hit, and and then it became a lot harder. Social media at the time was kind of MySpace, uh, and that was a, a larger presence than Facebook. MySpace was still a little bit hard to to reach who you wanted to reach. And that's why for Dorkness Rising, we ended up thinking, gosh, uh, should we go, instead of self-distributing, which was our original plan, should we try and hit a larger market and and go traditional distribution? Because we couldn't figure out how to break out. We needed, you know, here we had a movie that was in high definition and uh, was a viewable, watchable movie on, on a completely introductory level uh, so people could watch it and not have to have any idea who we were before. And actually movie length unlike the original gamers which I think right. helps with uh, acceptance. Yeah, so um, so we did partner, we did sign on with a distribution company um, and the only one thing they, I think they ever did right was they got us on a Netflix. That was huge. And we actually got Darkness Rising on Netflix for quite a while, and it had an amazing amount of reviews up there. Um, that was where I saw it originally, because uh, Ben and I used to room together, and he had shown it to me when we were living together. Yeah, gosh, I would kill to have that thing back up there. Um, so you're no longer partnered with this distribution company? No, they don't even exist anymore. And oh. it's not surprising. No. <laughs> No, they owe us about thirty grand that we will never see ever in our lives. But um, but no, I mean that that was a big that was a huge help as far as getting exposure out. We didn't make any money off of it, but a lot of people, um, a lot of people got to know about us through that, and that was amazing. Um, and then shortly after that, Facebook became huge. And suddenly we were kind of able to reach our audience again directly and better than a distributor could do for us. And that was huge. Um, and so we had a lot of ground to make up uh, to try and, and, and engage. Because at one time before that, I counted um, something like 40,000 fans from the store and various convention sales and things like that, you know, um, units. I mean, that's amazing. And, um, you know, and now I'm trying to figure out where they all went. <laughs> 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 trying to get them back, saying, please come back. We're, we're not, we're back from the dead. We're back now. <laughs> yeah. Um, we went away for a while. So. I'm so thankful for Zombie Orpheus who uh, continued to crank out content. Um, fire burning. Yeah, and we just sort of, uh, you know, Ben would come to me and said, do you want that gentleman's name on this? And I was like, Journey Quest? Yeah, that looks awesome. And <laughs> it's got a bunch of DG people involved. Yeah, let's do it. And so we licensed the brand, and there you go. Um, same thing with uh, Hands of Fate, really. Uh, we were just starting to come back, but we didn't have the wherewithal as a company to really produce that, and a lot of people don't know that, but that's why our partnership's so strong with Zombie Orpheus, because it's, again, there's a lot of overlap um, between the members and who's active and, you know, creating content and stuff like that, so. And then Facebook kind of turned the screws and changed their algorithms and Screwed everybody. For everyone you want to see it. Oh yeah, uh, Andrew, my partner for the Dracarium, it j has gone on at length about how much he hates Facebook now since they basically want you to pay for ad space. And they're not very good at it either, no. by the way. Uh, even if you give them money, it's like no, no real measurable difference. Um, I will say though, this time around, we're doing the the Kickstarter right now, and um, when we did the Kickstarter for House Rules, uh, 
several weeks ago, um, the the numbers coming from Facebook was atrocious. It was so scary because 70 to 80 percent of all the people that uh, supported Gamers Hands of Fate on Kickstarter came from Facebook. And here it was like 28 um, percent. And now I'm pleased to say it's it's back up to 60 percent or so or more um, on the on the Kickstarter we're running now. So at least that's better. But but to j long answer to your question about that. But yeah, um, obscurity. We're facing it again now. It's kind of kind of come full circle again. Have you started using Google Plus more? Or have you reached out in, like, say, Twitter or any other kind of social media to kind of get your get your name and your brand back out there? Yeah, we're working on that. Uh, Google Plus doesn't seem to be all that ubiquitous. Uh, doesn't seem to be a lot of people using that. If people would use it, it would be great, but it's yeah. just a ghost town. You hear that, Andrew? I'm not the only <laughs> one that says it. That's and as to mention, uh, you saw what happened when we tried to do Reddit too. Yeah, good God. <laughs> yeah, uh, but I will say, uh, Twitter's a challenge for us because most <laughs> of us to get it. <laughs> most of us don't understand it. I don't understand it. Jimmy doesn't understand it. And so, there, I mean, not just understand. It, I know what it is, and I but I don't use it, and it's not useful to me in that way to be tweeting. Exactly you know, constantly throughout the day. And so we need people who do that to to do that for us. And I I don't know who that is at the moment. <laughs> it's on the plan. It's on the marketing plan. Really the best way is I've actually been picking up followers here recently just by following new people. And uh, amazingly enough, say it with hashtags. That would be my advice. Mm-hmm. Yes, because people will be th scrolling through the hashtag and like, oh, that's funny, click, and they just follow you. It's really, really weird how okay. quickly you can pick up followers on Twitter. Great. And they all have such great deals on low-priced handbags. It's crazy. <laughs> <laughs> um, the other one that I know that we need to really work on is getting people to subscribe to our YouTube channel. Um, that's a big one because uh, we're going to be – Doing a lot. On it. <laughs> yeah, we're going to be doing a lot more with that YouTube channel. Um, Zombie Orpheus has something like twenty six thousand subscribers, and we've got seven thousand, something like that, um, or just under seven thousand. So we need to get those up, um, which shouldn't be too hard. But again, it's yeah. kind of coming into the game a little late, so we're we're trying to figure out what's the best way to do that. No, we'll defi I'll, I'll definitely make sure that I tweet it out. Benjamin, you too. You make sure you do that. Uh, you're not my real dad, so uh, <laughs> I do what I want. Of course I'm not. I'm... Uh, anyway. Uh, moving back to the distinguished guests and not the jackass in the orange shirt. <laughs> do you guys have any sequels planned for any of your established franchises? Sure. I mean... <laughs> Gamers 4 is in some very early pre-production, I believe. Right. Um, yeah. We, we have, have... We've got um, various ideas about what to do with Demon Hunters. Um, we're we've actually to... got a, a new short coming out tomorrow. Mm -hmm. a Demon Hunters short. Slash yeah. the Blitic Ninja Vampire short. Right. <laughs> so... Um, I do have some thoughts on doing more syphilitic ninja vampire episodes as well. Um, we've got a lot of those in the hopper. I just need to see if um, there's enough fans to go, yeah, we want more of that. <laughs> I think it's hilarious, but... Um, in a perfect world. The name alone is enticing. Yeah. Right? <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, yeah, actually, so the thing, and then I know a lot of people ask us about Journey Quest Season 3, and that's really a zombie, that's a zombie Orpheus <laughs> property, and it's a zombie Orpheus um, project that they're working out. So I actually don't have a lot of information about that. Um, but I know that there there's a lot of demand for it, and I know that they're working on trying to figure it out. I don't, I don't, that's as far as I know. 
So you will defer questions to Zombie Orpheus then? Yes. On that one, yeah. I'm kicking the, the ball down the pike there. <laughs> I also mix my uh, metaphors quite a bit, so... Okay, coming off of that question, you guys mentioned a lot of different projects. How do you guys handle having so many different ideas and franchises? Do you pick different ones to, like, say, that are your main topics of focus, like your demon hunters and gamers, or is it just difficult to juggle all of them? Uh, honestly, we go where the energy is the most. Um, so Jimmy and Ben started up the Demon Hunters webcomic. There was already enough energy that they were just going to go do it, and that's awesome. So I just kind of came along and said, well, I'll provide some infrastructure and support for you, um, and and we'll get it out there. Um, and that just really started to generate more interest and in, in excitement around Demon Hunters, and so we got to thinking about kind of rebooting the role-playing game which I guess we haven't talked about yet. But, um. And also, like, House Rules, that was a, a Chris Odie and uh, Sarah Sanders project, Ooh. really. They they took the reins on that and made it happen after 10 yeah. years of it sitting in <laughs> a shelf somewhere doing yeah. nothing. I mean, that's a project that's been in the can for a decade. And it we just have never had the energy to, to put it together. Um and uh, they they finally did it, and that's awesome. So, so uh, it pretty much comes down to: is there someone willing to take the reins on a project? And if so, that project's probably going to happen. <laughs> pretty much. Right on. So, Demon Hunters, ha you guys started with the films originally, and now mm -hmm. it's been rebooted by the web comic and the accompanying tabletop game, which we'll talk about a little bit later. Uh, have you guys have you guys thought about branching out in other ways, like video games or? Just regular novels. Yep. Uh, Video games would be awesome. <laughs> we've I had, would love to see them. yeah, we've had an idea for a video game for a long time. It's just how, like, that just seems pie in the sky to me. <laughs> um, we actually got some energy around a Kentucky Blue Clay uh, video game that uh, has sort of halted in its energy, but I think that still could. Could happen, Jimmy. You want to talk a little bit about that? Um, it's. Uh, I said that I would love to be a part of it, not as the main writer, but right. uh, and Vansel showed some interest, and then uh, we never saw heard from Vansel again. So, <laughs> uh, but yeah, I would love to have that happen. He's a great character. You got the the time travel aspect, and uh, we're aiming at it as like a uh, old school Lucas Arts or Sierra um, adventure game point-and-click adventure, which I think he's a, a great character for that. Yeah. So. Now would be a really good time to kind of do that, too, with the success of Telltale's The Walking Dead. Adventure right. games are kind of seeing a resurgence. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they're so fun, too. God. Literally anything can get on Steam anymore, too, so... Yeah, seriously. <laughs> <laughs> they do not say no. <laughs> right. Yeah, um, as far as novels go or... or you know, stuff. We've had an anthology idea for a while just to get a bunch of people sort of telling stories in that world. Um, uh, now with Kickstarter going, I definitely am, have been thinking about having Jimmy write a novel and we kickstart one. <laughs> so we can pay you. Yay, that'd be awesome. <laughs> First time hearing about it. I just made it up right now. <laughs> Breaking news here on the Geek of All Trades yeah. podcast. I could, but yeah, but anyway, like I say, I could see it happen. It's just a matter of, again, you have to weigh out what do you think is going to succeed. And when you work on a project and when you decide something that you're going to do, you also have to take into consideration in a serious way, uh, are people going to buy this? Or is and if not, can you do it so that it doesn't cost hardly anything and you can just go have fun and to go do it? I say, and uh, that seems to be the thing I've heard it a lot of times. It's if, if especially if you're looking to make a business venture, if the business isn't making money, the business fails. Yeah, <laughs> pretty much. <laughs> um, 
Now, I guess, uh, gentlemen, we really haven't made money uh, over the years for a long time, but but it's enough to keep the expenses of the company going. And again, we all weren't going in this thinking this was our career. Different phases of the business we've wanted to do that, but a number of us actually moved to Los Angeles and lived down there for uh, several years and got to see what that's like. Um, and there's a reason they're all back. It's and terrible. we all moved back. <laughs> you know? um, for me, I saw what it means to be a professional filmmaker and the kind of life that you would have to have. Uh, and it's just not something I wanted. Um, yeah, just hookers and below get boring after a while. Yeah. I mean, you live gig to gig. It's twenty-eight hour days, and um, you know they they actually make you invent time in Hollywood. <laughs> yeah, they make you use that extra, utilize that extra four hours a day. Right. <laughs> so. Yeah. yeah. So ultimately, the the big budget Hollywood flick is not a goal. For you guys, necessarily in the long run, at least, like if you can continue to be independent and do it your way, but not through, like, say, a Paramount or anything like that. I have no interest in that kind of thing. Um, I, uh, if I'm going to do this, I want to, I want to do it the way we want to do it, and I want to have fun. And the moment it stops being fun, we're not going to do it anymore. Fair enough. That's true with everything. I mean, it's kind of what happened, which is kind of why we went away for a while. Yeah, it stopped we being kind fun. Of just stopped having fun. And that was one thing. I, yeah, that was, back into it. Yeah, so that actually does answer the question. I was going to ask you why the hiatus, but it just burnout. Burnout, huge. I mean, the stress of darkness rising kind of killed DG for a while. Yeah, it did. I mean, we, you know. It burn us out on having actual equity investors. Um, it burn us out on that responsibility to them, which we still carry. Uh, burn us out on trying relationships with other companies to to reach us and basically having them, you know, take advantage of the situation. It just stopped being fun, and then to. You know, once you're that far in the hole and having trying to figure out how you're going to do the next thing, there's just not a lot of enthusiasm over it, you know. Um, so timing was correct, I think, and uh, the right project came about again, and or projects, I should say, and suddenly there's creative energy going and... and uh, so there you go. I mean, I think that's. I think every artist experiences that. Benjamin, care to comment on that? Uh, yeah, it can really suck uh, getting burnt out when people just have such high demands for your time and energy. Jimmy. It's <laughs> <laughs> my <Slide laughs> jab there. Um. <laughs> yeah, I gotta be honest. I was kind of. I was rude faster. <laughs> Um, yeah, uh, I was burnt out there for a while and uh, just kind of wanted to get back into arts. I, I'd always dreamed of being a big comic book artist or, or some kind of big uh, Magic the Gathering card painter or something like that. Um, but then I discovered Fallout. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, entire years of my life were, you know, just flew by and I go, oh, if I'm ever going to be a professional, I need to sit down and just do this. And, uh, I managed to go to a convention where I met, uh, well, I met Matt Vansel back when uh, Don and I, or not Don and I, Don and Matt were at Spokon doing a 4th uh, edition game. Don, you remember that? Yep. Yep. And uh, I guess this was during that kind of lull because, you know, you were starting to go into that obscurity because I remember being able to jump into that game because a prize winner didn't claim it or something like that. Mm. And... Um, so, yeah, I managed to get in there and be like, hey, guys, how's it going? And do uh, you ever need me to draw anything for you? And, uh, later on, Matt emailed me saying, well, here's a script for Demon Hunters. We were trying to reboot it into a web series, but maybe it worked better as a webcomic. And I was like, sweet, I tricked these guys into thinking I was a professional. <laughs> and uh, 
I've been very, very slightly keeping up that facade this whole time. And uh, it does get tiring. I do need to kind of you know, ramp up my my skill level and my production, but I think I'm getting there, right, Jimmy? <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, I'm going to get back to work right now. <laughs> Good man. No, All right, have um, you guys actually... Oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. I just wanted to say I'm super thankful for Ben. He is an incredible talent, despite whatever he thinks, and yeah. I am, could not be happier. I'm loving that I'm able to work with him on this comic. Oh, yeah. Despite the pain in the ass that he is, um, <laughs> he uh, uh, he does great work, and he makes us look good. No kidding. Oh, thanks, guys. It's great to be that new little brother that everybody gets to shit on, and then compliment it by, but he's such a cool little guy. <laughs> <laughs> now it's time for a swirly. <laughs> <laughs> if he just didn't deserve it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh. Okay, so have you guys thought about branching out into other genres? Because most of the stuff that you guys do is kind of medieval fantasy-based. Definitely. Um, I mean, it's got a lot of stuff. I mean, that, I think that's why we're focusing a little bit more on Demon Hunters right now, because we kind of want to do that horror action comedy genre. Um, there's some Lovecraft, Cthulhu, Cthulhu kind of stuff that we'd love to be working in. Uh, we have an opportunity to do that with this new game. And uh, and then work that into the the canon of the world and and the story. So um, so there's that. And then of course sci-fi. Obviously that's I mean there's definitely stuff to do. But it comes down to feasibility and and can you can you do that and make it look good and do what you want. Um, and I think that Transolar Galactica is a huge inspiration because okay. those guys. If you haven't seen that show, it's hilarious, number one. Uh, they write it well, and um, it looks fantastic, and a lot of it's green screen. Um, so I we got a lot to learn from those guys. <laughs> yeah, I mean, again, uh, we're geeks. This is the kind of movies you should... You should see the conversations Jimmy and I have about what crappy show to watch on Netflix. <laughs> But yeah, again, it, it comes down to having someone willing to take the reins, and uh, if someone has the time and the idea to make something happen. And so, so far, no one's come forward with a, a cool sci-fi project for us. <laughs> Although it seems, it seems good to have that. <laughs> Just, it seems good to have that kind of synergy yeah. among your team because I like when you guys are talking about watching what crappy show to watch on Netflix. My wife and I actually got into a four-hour fight, not an argument, not a debate, a fight over Mass Effect 3's ending. <laughs> <laughs> well, hang on, hang on. What were the sides? Uh, <laughs> kind of. uh, she she was well, for I'll, the indoctrination theory, and I was against it. Uh, <laughs> ah. We could go off topic pretty easily. I will shut up. <laughs> so uh, this question is kind of for the three of you, since you guys are a lot more ingrained in tabletop culture than I am. Ben always wants me to play, but I just don't have the time. I just that's the biggest thing: rolling characters and and what have you. What for? Uh, we'll start with Don. We'll move to Jimmy, and then go to Benjamin. Favorite tabletop game or version? Say like D and D three point five. Ah, um, that's a tough one. Um, I actually really like Demon Hunters. <laughs> oh no shit! Yeah. Um, I think I think for years I really loved D and D three point five. I was not ready to move on when fourth edition came out. Um, so I've enjoyed Pathfinder. I've reached a point where I'm saturated with that level of complexity and, and rules, and I just want something simple that I can jump in and play and have fun. And hence why I'm kind of gravitating towards fate right now, um, and and that sort of genre um, or style. That's my answer for now. I've uh, never been a gamer. I've played five sessions of role-playing games in my life, and four of them have been webcast to the DG audience. Um, 
So, and they were all demon hunters. I like it. I think it's a lot of fun, but uh, it's never been something that I've done. I've uh, I've written for several uh, RPGs. I I wrote on the original Demon Hunters RPG, and for the um, uh, because of that, Cam Banks hired me on to work on the Supernatural RPG and a couple of the expansions to that, and then uh, two expansions to the Leverage RPG. And uh, I also worked on the Mask of Death module, uh, the Pathfinder module for the, um, D- the Zoe Kickstarter for that, and um, I'm working on the new one. So I have a lot of I have more writing experience than I do playing. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I I I love uh, the old uh, Demon Hunters RPG. We haven't actually play tested the new one yet. I I just love the uh, how it focuses on the storytelling. I I. All of the dice and the math has never really made sense to me from a gaming standpoint. Uh, it uh, just seems like too much work to be having fun with. So I like just being able to throw a handful of plot points at Don and say, and then this happens. <laughs> yeah, so uh, first of all, I don't play games. I lift weights and drink beer. <laughs> uh, just kidding. No. I, I love Pathfinder. Uh, for me, a lot of the number crunching and... and dice rolling, I really enjoy that, the, the accounting of it all. Uh, mainly just because as much as I love playing with action figures as a child, I was always trying to constrain the world with rules and logic and, and what would happen. Uh, for me, it's the I do love the storytelling, but it's the rules that change it from a bunch of people just playing make-believe, and I hit you, no you didn't, and turns that into like a simulation of, okay, well... I want to attempt something, what's my probability of success, and then what will I do based on that outcome, and then what will I do after that. So for me, it's more of a problem-solving simulator where I don't get to be so much in charge of what happens, but how I react to it. Right. And so in that case, yeah, Pathfinder is definitely my favorite. I Just off camera, I've got like basically every... I've got all hard covers and a couple of the soft covers. Uh, hashtag swag. And... Uh, <laughs> Yeah, but no, Demon Hunters, uh, I also, I do like the plot point thing, because that really, it, it really does come at the idea from two different angles, and so I, I hate to say the one's better than the other, uh, it really depends right. on what kind of mood and what kind of, what you want to accomplish when you're sitting down with your friends at that table. Exactly. I actually... So, I'm uh, oh, sorry, yeah, for the sake of my employment, uh, Demon Hunters, check it out. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I was going to just piggyback on that, because... Uh, I actually started gaming with the Dead Gentleman guys. Like that's my first introduction to gaming. Uh, Nathan Rice and Steve Wolbrecht, in particular, um, got me into Second Edition D and D, um, and that was just when Third Edition was, started to come out. So I, I got to play in Second Edition for a bit, and then Third Edition all the way through. Um, but as much guff as 4th edition got, I really liked that I didn't have to buy all the books. I liked that I could create my character, and I actually created this Masters of the Universe campaign. Uh, <laughs> literally, it's a He-Man campaign, and uh, we made it 26th level, and during a time when Nathan Rice was unemployed, and he basically created a 26th level version of every... He-Man and She-Ra character you can think of. Literally everyone. I was trying to go super obscure on them, and they're all in there. <laughs> I have printed them out into a binder, and now it goes with me, and we can just go play He-Man whenever we want now. Thank you, 4th edition. <laughs> it, it worked. So 4th edition D&D works extremely well for that kind of campaign idea um, or, or gameplay, so... Um, again, it just depends on stuff. what's that. So kind of like just like crossover stuff, being able to like insert another universe into the du- the Dungeons and Dragons like mythos and rules. A little bit, but it's also the customization. You know, I love that I can pull up that monster builder and kind of steal powers from this and that and sort of hodgepodge and create trap jaw. Um, and they have to fight him and. You know, um, it's, I don't know, that it's just awesome. And it, it kind of plays to a bit of a cheesiness factor. And I think 4th edition is a little cheesy. But I like it for that. I'm really excited to play 5th edition. I haven't, I haven't seen anything about it. 
I've heard it. I've seen a couple mentions on Twitter about it, but I really haven't. I haven't heard it whether it's good or bad. So I know a lot because a lot of people didn't seem to like Fourth Edition coming off of Three and a Half. Why do you think that was? That's a very different game. Yeah. You know, it's a very different type of gameplay or game feel. You know, we have a long running epic level campaign going on um, with a lot of the DG guys, uh, just f folks from college that we've been playing for years and years. And fourth edition just didn't work out, especially we had this epic Scion uh, character, and um, Scionix just doesn't feel right in fourth. Um, we keep trying to think about resurrecting it and, and whatever, but, um, you know, I think that's just part of it, is that 4th uh, edition had a lot of that MMORPG, wizard, you know, World of Warcraft kind of feel to it. And it was a marketing and a and sort of a, a gameplay shift uh, that they decided to go on. And, and so, yeah, I mean, I just think it's a, it's a different game. Um, I play, we have a long-running 4th edition campaign right now where I play an illusionist, a known illusionist, kind of a usual thing, and illusion powers don't feel very illusory. They just, it's like a, a fluff on a mechanic, you know. Um, in, other, in, other, in other types of gameplay, it works great, but for some reason that one, I just, style-wise, it doesn't feel right. All right. So you guys have had successful Kickstarters in the past. How do you kind of feel about the crowdfunding boom that's been going on? Like Kickstarter is now huge, and now you have other platforms like Indiegogo and GoFundMe. Uh, how do you guys feel about like crowdfunding, for lack of betterment, culture, and how big crowdfunding has gotten? You want to start, Jimmy, or? Uh, it's been really good to us so far. <laughs> <laughs> um, honestly, the, the ability to go out and directly ask for money from uh, people who want to support the movie is how Dead Gentlemen got started. Our, our first movie, Demon Hunters, was funded by Ben Dobbins going around our college campus and asking everyone he saw for 20 bucks to make a movie. And so uh, I maintain that Ben invented Kickstarter. Uh, <laughs> so ever since then, that's kind of... Uh, is kind of a back to basics for yeah. us, uh, going directly to the fans saying, if you want us to make this movie, give us the money and we'll make it. Right. Or if you want us to make this game, or you know whatever our, our project is at the time. Yeah, I mean, you covered it great. Uh, I it is a boom. I think it, it works. Uh, the danger that I know a lot of people are seeing, especially this month, unfortunately, uh, is a bit of uh, Kickstarter burnout. You know, we particularly RPG burnout. <laughs> yeah, a lot, just a, <laughs> a lot of them launched this month, and we're we're no exception. But so you can see a lot of that marketing and get sort of oversaturated with it. And from a consumer point, that can be a little tiring. Um, but I think it, at the same time, I really like it too. I, I'm really interested to see what other projects are out there and look at the rewards and you know I've learned a lot having done these now and, and watched Ben do them and construct them and really understood really understand how to strategically create those rewards and and the levels and where where it sort of drives those things and what's the best value and you got to be thinking about you know the people who are buying it and what's going to be best for them, how are they going to like And that's a different mindset that creators are not used to. That's more sales than it is um, creation, uh, content creation, and because it's all for you to be able to create content. Um, so it's a sort of a combination of different skill sets that um, that's why you see a lot of people don't get it, and they create really weird Kickstarters, uh, the way they, they construct them. Um, others I've seen, um, you know, do really well. So I, I like it. I think it's a good, uh, I think that we're going to have to continue to think about how we engage that kind of crowdfunding. I have a hard time going off of Kickstarter uh, 
and going to Indiegogo or something else. I just, uh, again, it's where where is the crowd where you're going to get the best bang for your buck. Um, and until something else comes along that can provide a better deal and <laughs> get more <laughs> higher successful chance of um, of doing what you want to do, then we go with Kickstarter. And on the uh, the web comic side of thing, Patreon uh, is uh, the new uh, Patreon being new has been really great for stuff that comes out regularly like that for your your web comics and podcasts and uh, artists stuff like that where it's an ongoing ongoing cost that you you need to be paying for and uh, we have really enjoyed that I think yeah. it's a great system set up for because uh, like Kickstarter it's it's easy to it's easy it's, it's good for raising money for a thing yeah so if you're making a movie or a game then Kickstarter is is great for that but for patreon where it's like I'm making a webcomic every week of the entire year, I asking for a lump sum for that is uh, <coughs> a little right. uh, harder to figure. Like, why would I support this? But yeah. if you can just give a little bit every month, that's awesome. Yeah, you know, again, it, Ben comes up with these amazing platforms and ideas, and uh, phase two look looked a lot like. What what he was what Zombie of Orpheus was was calling Phase Two uh, looked a lot like uh, Patreon or or maybe vice versa. Kind maybe. of exactly like Patreon. <laughs> yeah, Patreon actually you know looked a lot like uh, uh, Phase Two, and and I think Ben saw it working with the Demon Hunters webcomic, and um, you know, and I think that again, sort of trying to figure out okay. Is what I have in mind going to be better or different than that, uh, or you know, should I not reinvent the wheel and and you know? Ben tends to come up with an idea about six months before the rest of the world, and then spend a bunch of money trying to build it custom and having it fail completely. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not saying phase two has failed, uh, but it's a. Uh, but to actually have build your own system when that's not what you should be doing, you should be. You know, producing movies, right? Yeah, and stuff. No, so I think running Patreon. <laughs> absolutely. So for the record, for the record, he did invent Kickstarter and Patreon. Right? Yes, exactly. Okay. <laughs> yeah. right, right. That is on the record. That is That's on the record that Ben Dobbins uh, single-handedly created Kickstarter and, and Patreon before. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> he's just that brilliant. It's it is credible. It's I mean his ideas are so amazing, um, and. Uh, so I'm just glad that we get to utilize those ideas. It's funny we some of the things that he and I had conversations 15 years ago mm -hmm. are now coming true. <laughs> it's insane. It's brilliant. So right, uh, oh, go sorry. ahead, Benjamin. In my thoughts on the whole uh, crowdfunding thing, it seems like, I mean, it's such a great idea, you know, for people to be able to directly fund what they want to see. Uh, I mean, we could have had a Firefly Season 2 if it had been crowdfunded. Um, but the idea that uh, I read somewhere that Kickstarter never wanted to be a pre-order tool. It never wanted to just be a order-taking right. uh, mm -hmm. software. And so the idea that, like, if someone had told me, hey, Ben, if you give a dollar to this, we'll get another season of the show, and then it will be for sale later, I would say, well, yeah, I would donate one dollar to make the thing exist at all so I can watch it. And so I'm, what I'm getting for my dollar is the ability to watch it. Then I can go on and buy the DVD. So I, I do wish that more people would realize that, and instead of saying, oh, well, I don't like these reward tiers, just be like, oh, well, here's a dollar to help make it exist. Mm -hmm. right? Yeah, and Absolutely. So that is the huge yeah. thing. Uh, Sean Reynolds actually had a huge blog that he wrote up about why um, donating one dollar to a Kickstarter can make a lot of a difference. Um, and he's right. And we'll take your one dollar, no problem. <laughs> Gladly. Um, you know, we'll say it through a Patreon campaigns. <laughs> <laughs> Links below. <laughs> yeah, for twelve dollars a year. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, 
That is the case, and that's why, I mean, our reward levels have huge margin. Uh, it Because it has to go to creating the content, and the reward is kind of a thank you. It's like the NPR, you know... Yeah, here's your tote bag. <laughs> yeah, here's your tote bag. Uh, here's your uh, car talk coffee mug. Um, you know, whatever. Uh, and that's that's the intent. And so we're trying to to do that. Um, but I I agree. I know it it, it can be kind of it can feel a bit pre-ordery. All right, so piggybacking off of that, the big thing is the Kickstarter for the Demon Hunter's Core Rulebook. Tell us about that and what can fans expect from the project. Yeah, you bet. I'm actually wearing the shirt from the the old one here. Show my boob. There, there you go. go. Um, thank you. Viewers have just plummeted. I know. <laughs> NC17 on YouTube. Sure. Yeah, I mean, we uh, we no longer have a business relationship with the um, the previous company, um, and rights reverted back to us anyway. And a lot of things have changed over the years, both with the property and with gaming. And so, uh, getting to think about telling stories in the Demon Hunters world, um, I actually had Jimmy write me a short story because uh, I was going to go run a game at ZoeCon. Uh, the first year, uh, the only year that it's been out. And I couldn't, I, I just went through the book and I couldn't figure out how best to construct a Demon Hunter's campaign uh, or a session. And so he wrote me a short story and I broke it out into encounter levels. And I saw a huge pattern that was really familiar um, in storytelling and and writing novels and, and stuff like that. And you can actually take elements um, from that structure and randomize them and create new stories. And, and I saw that, so I started mapping that out. And in the conversation, we decided, you know, instead of this just being sort of like a Game Master supplement, let's re... Is it worth doing an entirely new edition? Is it worth doing a new book? Um, and so it definitely I... It wasn't worth doing an addition to a game that almost no one was playing. Right. That's the Kickstarter that wouldn't be successful. Right, yeah. <laughs> I mean, our goal would be significantly lower. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but what did we want? And ultimately it came out to that we decided we wanted more people to be introduced to the world of the Demon Hunters and to be able to play in the world and create their own stories in the world. And have this be sort of a shared existence. And so we decided to create a brand new game. Um, it has no ties to the old game whatsoever. Uh, it's completely new, spank, brand spanking new, fresh. Uh, the only thing that is tied to it is obviously it's still Demon Hunters uh, with the new canon based on the webcomic that Ben and Jimmy are doing. And um, what people can expect is that it, it is a comedy, action, or um, role-playing game. And you can have any mix of that that you like. So if you, if you like the comedy, then we'll show you how to do it. And it's the, just putting the adventure together and putting your character get it together, you get that flavor, and you under, it, it's very easy to understand how to do it. Um, we provide you with a story structure, storytelling structure, and an admission, adventure creation system that um, can provide you the, the backbone of a campaign that you can start in 15 minutes. It's really designed, the whole game is designed to get you playing from scratch quickly uh, because a lot of us are getting older and don't have time to plan it out. <laughs> um, but yeah, so it's it's Demon Hunters, it's horror comedy, uh, action, it's like the A-Team in Supernatural uh, with some Monty Python, <laughs> something like that, I don't know. Uh, That's a good amalgamation, I like that, uh, I like that description. Yeah, um, everybody likes to use those, it doesn't really tell you too much, but it gives you a sense, and since we're not professional game designers... Uh, but we do not do storytelling. We decided to 
contact the people that we already know. Uh, Cam Banks at the time was still with Margot Weiss Productions uh, doing Cortex Plus um, and the Marvel Heroic System. And the beginning of this year, I believe, he parted ways to go do sort of his own thing, um, be independent, and then Atlas Games snatched him up. Immediately snatched him. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. And so, you know, the steady paycheck and the health insurance uh, can be pretty compelling. <laughs> um, so, so anyway, he decided to go ahead and, and uh, he's agreed to be our lead designer. And we, uh, at his suggestion, were, we decided to look at Fate, uh, which is a very successful, um, interesting gameplay that's simple and easy to get into. Uh, there's a new, brand new uh, Icons Assembled edition that's out um, that's sort of a Fate hack and um, really fun sort of superhero uh, game. So he's, the Demon Hunters are a bit superhero-like, so he's pulling elements of that into the mechanics as well. Um, and so if you like Fate and you, you like that type of game, uh, this is definitely a, a system that you're going to want to own. It's sure. also being built for your normal polyhedrals, though, so you don't need the special fudge dice. Correct, yeah. I felt very strongly, since I have a designer at my disposal, <laughs> um, <laughs> that I could have a game, any game that I wanted uh, to have done. And so, I yeah, he asked me about the dice, and I said, you know, I just, I would, people have, you know, a bucket of dice. Uh, <laughs> I don't and, think everybody has that kind <laughs> of bucket of dice. <laughs> but... You know, people have their own polyhedros. Let's play with polyhedros. You know, I I like I like rolling dice and rolling different kinds of dice, and d sixes are boring, um, and and I didn't. But not too boring. It's one of our reward levels. <laughs> right. <laughs> d <D6s. laughs> Well, I you know we decided to make them less boring and put our logo on it and make it awesome. Um, so yeah, and I get to you know we get to pick the colors. And that's awesome. So, um, yeah, and the dice actually uh, were pretty close to choosing that. Um, I'm trying to get a, a full set of polyhedrals. I'm promising six dice. I haven't decided if we're going to do D6s uh, or a full set of polyhedrals, um, excluding the D20s. And uh, I have a, a line on a really good idea for the polyhedrals, so we'll see if that works out. But it's all, all going to be cost-effective, kind of thing, what this term is. Um. All right, so a lot of Kickstarters do have stretch goals. I have a question about the stretch goals. Can you guys oh. make a stretch goal to make the rule book bound by human flesh? <laughs> <laughs> you volunteering? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, only if you volunteer your flesh. Unfortunately, I can't. I mean, I, would, I wouldn't mind contributing to the cause, but it'd have to be, like, off my ass or something. I have to stay alive. <laughs> you know, I, uh, I, I, can't leave, I can't leave my wife alone with the little one. She can be a handful. Your wife or the daughter? <laughs> um, I, don't, I don't know, Benjamin. You lived with her. You tell me. Yeah, never mind that. Um, you know, I think, uh, I think Vlad knows the human flesh guy. Right, right. <laughs> that fictional character, we can always call him. All right, so uh, I think that'll about wrap it up. Did you guys have anything that you wanted to add, anything you wanted to plug? Where can we find you? DemonHuntersRPG.com is the big one right now. Come come see our Kickstarter. Check it out. Uh, to, uh, I, we haven't gotten to the point where it's you know, YouTube slash channel slash Dead Gentleman yet. I'm trying to figure out how to do that. But, <laughs> but we have a Dead Gentleman channel, so search us out and subscribe there. Uh, we're on Facebook and deadgentleman.com. Subscribe Demon to our newsletter. Yeah. Demon-hunters.com. Right, and that one too. Because <laughs> someone else owns demonhunters.com. Yes, yeah, so don't go there. <laughs> <laughs> Never know where you'll end up. 
All right, gentlemen, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate you guys taking time. We're all busy being adults and responsible <laughs> adults, at least three of us in the podcast anyway, Benjamin. Yeah. And um, so check out the Demon Hunters webcomic. Make sure to check these guys out at Dead Gentleman Productions on Facebooks and Twitters and Google Plusies and all that kind of stuff. This has been the Geek of All Trades podcast. I am Merlo Williams. Thank you guys for tuning in, and we'll see you around.